Hello, friends and family. Welcome back to Big Dogs Gotta Eat, BDGE. You can't see the sign because my beautiful donuts are covering them. Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. My name is Nicholas. Welcome if you're new. Welcome, Bike, if you are a longtime subscriber. It's gonna be a fantastic episode today. A lot of info. This might be a long one. Possibly have timestamps down below. There might just be too many damn names and big facts dropped in this one for me to even consider that. We're getting into my top 20 running backs for the 2019 fantasy football season. We're doing my rankings, my top 20. Now, normally I break them down, you know, six at a time, eight at a time. We're going 20 guys today, 20 deep. Gang, 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 gang. They're also going to be broken down by tiers, which is the important part here. So when you're doing rankings, when you're in the middle of your draft, tiers, tiers based drafting is very important because someone ranked RB5 instead of RB4 may not seem like much of a drop-off in terms of overall rankings, but if there's a tier break, meaning the top four running backs, hint, hint, cough, cough, ja, 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 are in another tier, that means they are valued much higher than that next tier. But whereas the drop-off from RB1 to RB4 might seem bigger, if they're in the same tier, they hold almost the same value in terms of draft capital, where from four to five is only a one ranking drop-off but there are probably other positional rankings in between that, if that makes sense. If you're uh, you know, new to fantasy football, you don't really understand tiers. What the fuck's going on with these donuts over here? Here's what's going on. It's National Donut Day. Literally my favorite holiday the entire year. Last year, I went all up and down New Jersey, and I went to like seven different donut shops. And I mean that. If you go to my Instagram and you look at my highlights, the one that says nut on it is legitimately like my entire day of National Donut Day. We grab some donuts. Uh, if you know anything about literally anything, you know that when you're pounding donuts... Two cups of milk is absolutely necessary. One is tall and skinny. We call that the Jordy Nelson cup. One, short and fat. We call that the Eddie Lacy cup. Strictly for dunking, strictly for drinking. I'm going to try my best not to eat these too much throughout the video because I know people get big mad on the internet when other people eat. Although there's a weird subsection of people on YouTube that like to watch people eat. So maybe some of you guys are that and maybe this will actually turn you on. I don't know. Either way, if you find value, if you find information, if you find entertainment, if you find anything in this video that you like, go down there, hit that thumbs up button. I would very much appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. I promise I'm not always bullshitting like this for the first four minutes of the video, but the information will be very, 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 very good. So today we're talking about my 2019 fantasy football running back rankings broken down by tier, the top 20. I love you. Let's get it. Not really a chocolate guy, but I went to the donut shop. There's a place Pies and Thighs around the block from me. It makes phenomenal fried chicken and waffles. They make homemade donuts too, they're really good. But they only had these three types. So I walked in that and I was like, give me all of them. Give me one of each. And that's what happened. And thus here we are talking about Saquon Barkley. In the beginning of the offseason, there was a good chance that I had Saquon Barkley in his own tier. He was the 101, the RB1 in a tier by himself. That's not the case anymore. The, the further we get into the offseason, I have these four guys stacked together in the top tier. It's Saquon Barkley, Kamara, C-Mac, and Ezekiel Elliott. I would not be mad at anyone for taking any of those four guys at the 101. They're all workhorses, or for Kamara's sake, he's less volume than a typical workhorse, but is arguably the best possible fantasy situation you could find yourself a running back in an offense that's behind Drew Brees, that scores a lot of points, that passes to their running backs at a higher rate than almost any team over the last couple of years. They're all in fantastic situations coming off very, very, very big years and ready to roll again in 2019. So with Barkley, I see a lot of people kind of shying away from Barkley now at the 101, and I can understand why, right? Just the offense overall, they lose Odell. They add Kevin Zeitler in free agency, and he was PFF's sixth highest overall graded guard last year. So it's a big improvement on the offensive line. Nate Solder, who they signed to a big contract, which is probably a little bit too big for the talent that he actually gave off. Linemen tend to be able to boost their value because there's not usually a lot of good linemen available in free agency. And when you're the only one there available, teams will, you know, give you that fat 40, 50, 60 million dollar contract. Anyways, he started playing a lot better over the second half of the year and got stronger as the year went on. He is going through some kind of ankle scope, so we'll have to see what exactly his health is at that tackle spot. So keep a close eye on that. Their line could be a lot better with Zeitler being added to the interior, which is always big for running backs. With Odell, there's all this talk about how Odell's not there. They're not going to be able to spread the field. When you look back at last year, though, the splits. He had 12 games played with Odell, four games played without Odell. The fantasy points definitely went down a bit. I'm not denying that, right? He went from 22 
half PPR fantasy points per game with Odell on the field, down to 18 and a half without Odell on the field. But here's the thing, the volume did not go down at all. Look at his rushing production. Rushing attempts went up. Rushing touchdowns went up. Rushing yards went up. Targets were exactly the same, 7.5. Things that went down last year, the overall receptions. The way I look at it is this. The receptions went down, the targets didn't go down, so the opportunity was still there. If you're going to have less receptions, obviously you're going to have less receiving yards and, and the fantasy points are going to go down. But when you think about that, just from a common sense standpoint, if the volume is still there, like why are the receptions going down? Does that have anything to do with Odell Beckham being on the field? I can understand this if Odell Beckham was off the field and then his target total dipped by like three or four, then you could say, oh, you know what? There's a reasonable explanation. They're just a worse offense, thus less volume for Saquon. But the volume was still there. He was getting the same amount of targets as he was with or without OBJ. He was getting more rushing work with OBJ off the field. To break it down a little further, as we always do, he had 30 targets in those four games without Odell Beckham. He caught 17, so 17 of 30 targets. He dropped three passes. The other 10 passes were deemed uncatchable. He couldn't catch 10 of the 30 passes that were thrown his way by Eli. None of this, again, has anything to do with OBJ. Those three drops that he had in those four games, again, nothing to do with OBJ. He had two total drops from weeks one through 13. Then all of a sudden OBJ is off the field and he just starts dropping balls. That's not predictive of what we're going to see in terms of volume going forward. What we saw last year really has nothing to do with OBJ. Is like, do I think the offense is going to be a little bit different? Sure. But I also think that means that Odell is probably, I mean, uh, Saquon is probably going to, you know, flirt with what C-Mac did last year in terms of breaking the record for receptions in a single season by a running back. So... When you look at the actual numbers, when you take them into context, which is super important, I don't see Saquon Barkley taking a big step back because Odell Beckham Jr. is off the field. Because realistically, that wasn't the case, especially not by a volume standpoint. Number two, I have Alvin Kamara here. He's just in a great situation, a great offense, a great quarterback. He has caught at least 80 passes in both of his seasons so far. So you're looking at exactly the floor. You know, Mark Ingram's out, Latavius Murray comes in, so I don't think that's really going to affect anything in terms of Kamara's role in the offense. Keep an eye on Divine Ozigbo, one of my favorite undrafted free agents out of Nebraska, someone that they took in after the NFL draft. He was someone that I thought was super talented. Um, I think that he might eventually push for work in that backfield, but not in Kamara's role. He's more of a, a bruiser, a two-down runner like a Latavius Murray. And Kamara's not going to give you the first four weeks of the season like he did last year with Ingram out, right? Those ridiculous like RB1 elite fantasy games. But I think you will be happy with the 18 to 20 fantasy points per game, half PPR, that he provided throughout the rest of the season. And he has three touchdown weekly upside on any given week. Love Kamara. He's just an absolutely phenomenal upside, downside pick right there at the number two spot, three, four, wherever, all in this tier together. Christian McCaffrey is my number three guy. Very similar to Kamara last year in terms of how we saw their production start increasing, right? They both saw a major uptick in touches in their year two of their respective offenses. C-Mac in his rookie year had 117 carries. That jumped up to 219 last year in his sophomore season. So that's over 100 carries, 100 more touches on the ground. More importantly, though, he scored seven rushing touchdowns, which was up from the two that he had in his rookie year, boosted his yards per carry from 3.7 to 5.0. I know that was a concern of mine because he was super inefficient on the ground in 2017, his rookie year. And then they lost Andrew Norwell, who was one of their, you know, Pro Bowl linemen. And I was like, dude, he might have a tough time, you know, making um, making up big chunk plays and and racking up those yardage totals. But he went for 5.0 yards per carry on 219 carries. Wasn't a concern, at least. And as we saw with my video with Noah last week, he talked about the Carolina offensive line being sneaky good and having sneaky top five upside. So the line is not a concern. He became, <coughs> excuse me need some Jordy Nelson. He became a big time playmaker last year, right? And not just that, but a player that you could actually depend on throughout the course of a game. He broke off three separate runs of 40 plus yards last year compared to just one in 2017. Four separate games of 100 plus rushing yards. That does not count any of the receiving yards. That's not total yards. Four separate games of 100 plus yards on the ground. He had zero of those games in his rookie year. The biggest change by far was his involvement in the end, near the end zone, in the red zone. 2018 compared to 2017, right? His rookie year, he played 70% of the snaps. That went up to 91% last year. The share of Carolina running back touches went from 45% to 95%. Let that sink in. 45% of the Carolina running back touches in 2017, up to 95% last year. The staggering part is how much upside he had with the touchdown totals, right? Red zone carry percentage, red zone touch percentage for the Carolina running backs rookie year, 19%. Last year, 58%. Inside the 10 zone, 13% is rookie year, up to 63% last year. Goal line, huge. 9.5% is rookie year, 
57% last year. Christian McCaffrey is as much of a bell cow on every part of the field, on the ground, through the air, as any running back in the NFL. So we'll have to see, you know, if Cam's shoulder is a little more strengthened, do they stop doing so many dump offs? Do they stop looking at such a low average depth of throw? Because Cam Newton, surprisingly, this is a fact I researched maybe a month or two ago, he actually had his highest adjusted completion percentage of his entire career last year, which is crazy because you felt like he was throwing like shit. His highest adjusted completion percentage in his NFL career, which adjusts for like throwaways and, and uh, spikes and shit. But he also had his lowest, lowest average depth of target in his career. Both of those numbers for the highest and the lowest were by far and away the most and, and least for his career. So can't think the Carolina offense is going to be kind of run the same way if Cam Newton's shoulder is healthy. So people are also saying, you know, they're going to lighten his workload. Christian McCaffrey's this year. They don't want to give him another 300, 350 touches. I would have maybe believe that if they had taken a big bruiser some kind of back in free agency or through the nfl draft they they draft this kid in the fifth round jordan scarlett who's 208 pounds and at this point like if, if you're seeing the pictures of christian mccaffrey and just how big he looks he is probably 208 pounds so there's really no reason to bring in a kid like jordan scarlett to take away groundwork from christian mccaffrey when he's not someone that you're going to put in short yardage situations and on the goal line because if he's the same size there's no reason really to do that so nothing scared here about christian mccaffrey Ezekiel Elliott is going to be a very popular pick, I think, to go into the number one range. He's as good of a pick as any of these guys, right? And this is the whole the whole premise of tiers, guys, because I think it's mostly up to you in terms of, yeah, I'm going to have one guy that's the one, two, three, four, only because you have to do it that way. Tiers help you kind of separate the value of these guys. All four of these guys are the top four picks. Once you hit number five, then you can debate throwing DeAndre Hopkins, Devontae Adams, or another running back or something in there. But these four guys set in stone, that's how you kind of utilize tiers. So with Zeke, he took a monster step forward in the passing game last year. We heard every offseason basically for Zeke, oh, he's a good pass catcher. He's going to catch more passes, get more receptions, get more targets. And we never saw it up until last year. And that really wasn't up until Amari Cooper came over from the Oakland Raiders. And then Zeke got super involved in the passing game. He set career highs with 95 targets, 77 receptions on the year. His career highs prior to that were 40 targets and 32 receptions. Over 100% increase on both of those statistics for career highs. It's actually kind of crazy to me that Zeke has only played three years. I feel like he's been in the league for like seven years at this point. But again, what we saw from him when Amari Cooper came over to Dallas just how improved this offense was overall was was really staggering. Like Zeke wasn't just really good. He was amazing, elite, probably the RB1 over the second half of the year. Six and a half receptions a game for a running back. Guys, do the math. I don't have the math over me, but that's over 100 receptions on the year if you're pacing that out to 16 games. From week 10 on, Zeke did not have a single game under five receptions. The question becomes... What is the norm for Zeke? Is he more likely to catch 70 passes in 2019? Or is he more likely to hover somewhere around like 45 to 50, right? That's going to be the differentiator, I think, whether or not he can really get up there to the Saquon level or if he can get up there to the Christian McCaffrey level, you know? I would probably side closer with 50 to 55 range. They drafted this kid from Memphis, Tony Pollard, who is more like a weapon. He caught a ton of passes in college, 39 last year, his last year in college, which is a very high number for a running back in college. He averaged 11.7 yards per reception. So he's a real weapon out of the backfield. I do think they're going to use him more though as just that, like as a weapon, not necessarily like, okay, Zeke, you're coming off the field, Pollard, you're on the field and you're going to catch passes out of the backfield. Maybe they utilize him at the same time. Maybe they use Pollard more in the slot. I think that's probably more likely what we'll see. So I don't think it'll really affect Zeke. Even if he catches 50 to 55 passes, that's still, still very, very, very good for a running back. And we're just being really skewed towards what we saw last year, right? We always have this recency bias as fantasy players. Like whatever happened last year seems like it's the norm when we don't take things into context because we saw so many running backs catch 65, 70, 80, 90, 100 passes, which is not normal whatsoever. That is such an outlier of a year. And I talked about this in Friday's mock draft video. If you missed that, I did a full 2019 fantasy mock draft. I brought up this tweet that I had, right? Last year was an absolutely like historic all-time year in terms of running backs catching passes. Look at the averages prior to last year, 2010 to 2017 for running back reception leaders. So you could see the average RB5, 58, RB8, 52, RB10, 49. Those are the averages in terms of what the RB5 finished with that year for reception total. So not, fan, yeah, like I'm not talking about fantasy RB5, I'm talking about reception leader total RB5. So whoever had the fifth most receptions 
has averaged 58 receptions over the last eight years. RB8 was 52, RB10 was 49. Last year, as you could see, the RB5 had nearly 20 more receptions than the last eight years average. RB8 had 11 more, RB10 had 10 more. So it was a ridiculously high year. So even if Zeke drops down from the 70, 75 he had, and he's down by 50 to 55, that's on average still like top 10, top eight, sometimes top five numbers. So don't let that like skew you away from Zeke if that had any indication on, on what you were gonna be doing with him. So why is he my four after you know seeing all of this stuff? It's it's because of that stupid incident that when he went to EDC, the elect electric dance carnival, whatever the fuck it is, and he had that problem with the security guard and he pushed the security guard or whatever to the ground. It's not a big deal. Like he got put in handcuffs, so the NFL is actually looking at it and it's Zeke, so he's had problems. So who knows? They might slap him with the two game suspension. He appeals it, it gets knocked down to one game. If Zeke's gonna miss one game for me, since they're all in the same tier, that's the tiebreaker for him being at the fourth. He's still in that top tier. Um, and we don't know if that's even gonna happen, but I'm kind of pretending as if like I'm drafting in best ball. So if I am drafting in best ball on draft.com and I have a top four pick, Zeke will be the last of those four picks just based on what might happen. And he's like the only one with that kind of red flag here. So that is tier one. If you enjoyed my explanation of tier one, and I'm prob that's probably gonna be the longest tier that we go into, a uh, thumbs up would be very much appreciated. Drop a comment down below if you disagree or agree with the tiers. I, I haven't seen anyone go outside of those first four guys in the first four picks. So if you have, let me know. I'd love to know like who they went with. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Tier number two, I want to drop a commissioner note here. If you're the commissioner of a league, I'm the commissioner of like five or six leagues, or if you just consider yourself to be a good friend or family member if you play with family members, I need you guys to do yourselves a favor and start using a platform such as teamstake.com. Think of it like Venmo, but Literally, it's specifically designed for your fantasy football league. So you create a league within it, right? You just go on teamstake.com, create your account, and then you create your league. And that is where people in your league will pay the buy-ins. You don't have to chase them around for cash. You don't have to keep asking them for Venmo. Someone sends you Venmo, someone sends you PayPal, another person sends you cash. Pain in the ass, TeamSake is completely free to use. They do not take a percentage of the pot. They don't charge you to actually use the software. It makes being the commissioner of your league like 80,000 times better. You literally create the league and then you just send a link and you're like, pay, but pay, 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 pay. So your friend doesn't have to worry about your time. You don't have to worry about his time. All he does is literally sign on, join the league, pay. Free payment and payout options. So they're not taking your money. If you want their security safety credentials, just go on teamsake.com and go find them. I'm not gonna read it off like a robot to you. But this is completely customizable too. What's really cool is that you can have a fee date. So if you're like, yo, we're drafting this, we need everyone paid by three weeks before, you set the date and you can also set a late fee. So if someone doesn't pay the $100 buy-in, put a late fee of you know $6 or something on there and that will give people incentive to do so. It's also like super customizable in terms of payouts. So you can make it first place gets 70%, second place gets 20%, third place gets 5%, first place regular season, first place most points regular season. Like it, it's tons of customization. You could have it roll over if you're in a dynasty league. Like a lot of my dynasty leagues, we make sure everyone pays not only that year's buy-in, but also 50% for the next year because for dynasty leagues, it's hard to get people that are in for the long run. But by paying 50% upfront and just having that roll over, that kind of secures them that they're gonna be back next year. So they're not just gonna sell the house in year one, try to win and then bounce. So, so Team Stake, please, 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 please do yourself a favor. They are sponsoring this video, but this is a platform that I use personally and I will be using personally going forward. It makes your league just so much easier to handle and coordinate. No Venmo, no PayPal. None of that stuff, teamstake.com, please go check them out. I will link them down below in the description. All right, my tier two is made up of two guys. That's it, this is how I break down my tiers. I don't throw just like six guys into each tier. I don't have, I don't throw them into tiers based on, you know, th these guys are two down grinders, these guys are only pass catchers. I believe like based on the value of those players where they should be in terms of tiers. My next two guys are Melvin Gordon at five, Joe Mixon at six. You're right after those first four backs. And I honestly, if there was a guy that I could see you having above one of those four guys, if for some reason you have a personal vendetta against one of them, Melvin Gordon is the one guy I'd say, okay, you know what? I could see him being like the number four back or something because he's as elite as they come fantasy wise, especially last year. He was averaging almost 21 half PPR fantasy points per game. So when he was on the field, he was as good as Saquon Barkley was. Um, Todd Gurley was the only guy that was ahead of him. The problem, of course, is his injury history, right? He's missed multiple games in three or four years. You know, you don't like when your running backs are battling with knee issues, but never anything like really serious. So Melvin Gordon is, you know, the workhorse here. 
you're getting elite production from him when he's on the field. This is a good offense that's been, you know, focusing on improving their offensive line year in and year out. They're going to score points. Even if they take a step back, they're still average, if not above average, compared to other teams. So he's in a very good situation where I think the floor is very high. Injury is the only concern there, but I'm not too, too, too concerned with it because Dr. Jesse Morris came on the channel and said he's not too concerned with Melvin Gordon either. Joe Mixon is in an offense that the situation is a little bit weird, but he is so young and there's no reason to assume that he's going to step back, right? He's like 22 years old going into his prime. So after a breakout year that he had last year, what's the worst that could happen? I think that's basically his floor, but a monster breakout, right? And he was kind of compared to Le'Veon Bell for a long time as someone who came in, was bad and inefficient his rookie year, came in overweight and then lost weight the second year in the second offseason, got more involved in the passing game, brought his efficiency up. That's exactly what we saw from Joe Mixon. And they're a very same style of player stylistically. And hopefully that the new offensive coordinator and head coach can finally use him that way. They use their first round pick 11 overall on Jonah Williams, right? The tackle out of Alabama. He is a three-year starter, proven player that's won accolades and awards and has a production and is almost a can't-miss prospect at this point. So he's going to shore up that line very, 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 very well for them. Billy Price, who was dealing with a foot injury, shout out to whoever in my comments let me know about that. He had a bad year last year, but apparently he was dealing with a foot injury for most of the time. So they are going to be improved. Billy Price was their first-round pick from last year. So they've used back-to-back first-round picks on offensive linemen. You can see what their focus is. So their new head coach, Zach Taylor, is coming over from the Sean McVay tree. Now, I'm not going to like buy into that meaning a whole lot, but it means that he will probably base his offense something around the way we saw the Rams kind of run things. And we saw Sean McVay immediately come in, sign Andrew Whitworth. That's exactly what they did with Jonah Williams. They take Jonah Williams, right? They're revamping that line, starting with the left tackle. I think they're going to start using, like they used Todd Gurley in the passing game so heavily, I w- we need to see Joe Mixon used like that. And I think that's what's going to happen here. If he can take that step up in terms of receiving, he is going to be, because he was like top five, top, I forget exactly where he was in terms of rushing yards, but he was among the league leaders, uh, among the running backs in terms of rushing yards. If he can get his running back production up from the receiving standpoint a little bit, he will be the next guy up into that elite tier next year. It wouldn't surprise me whatsoever if we started looking at him in, in the elite RB1 tier. Their offense under Marvin Lewis has just been so bad these last couple of years, right? Last year, 25th in yards per drive, 24th in time of possession per drive, 24th in three and outs per drive, 23rds in plays per drive to slow non-productive, horrible for your running back to be part of that, right? They're going to be a different offense this year. So that's what I like about Joe Mixon. So I have Melvin Gordon, I have Joe Mixon as the respective workhorses, the featured backs in their offenses. One has a little bit of an injury concern. You could say Joe Mixon has a little bit of an injury concern, but I'm not really worried about that at all. The other one is more of like offensive question marks, but both of them have re- have the upside to get into that elite tier if they want to. Also, if you don't want to listen to me talk anymore, uh, I will have my rankings. I will do the top 25 rankings, not just the top 20, which are what's covered in this video. If you want to hit the link down below, it'll be labeled the top 25 rankings, broken down by tiers, PPR, standard, half PPR. They will be uh, available for download. You could print them out if you want and use them for whatever you're doing now. Uh, so I just wanted to drop that. I'll put that in the comments as well as in the description. Tier three. Tier three is another two running back tier. We have Dalvin Cook and we have David Johnson. Dalvin Cook is a guy I absolutely love from a talent standpoint, right? He could do it all. He could run. He can, he's actually like a sneaky good goal line runner too. He was a prolific scorer in college. He just hasn't gotten really the opportunity to get that in Minnesota. I'm not sure he's gonna, but he's amazing in the pass, uh, in the passing work, uh, passing downs, excuse me, uh, as well. So you have Dalvin Cook, you have David Johnson. The concern with Dalvin Cook is, of course, the injury history. He's missed so much time between the ACL tear two years ago, his rookie year, and then the hamstring issues that he dealt with last year. Tweeted this out a couple days ago. Since entering the league, Dalvin Cook has played in 10 games where he's played on 60% or more of the Vikings offensive snaps. So those are games basically that Dalvin Cook was, you know, the starter and he was getting, if Dalvin Cook's on the field, he's getting 60% of the snaps. So those are the full games basically that he's played. His per game numbers in those 10 games, 15.2 carries, 5.2 5.2 targets, 4.1 receptions, 102.1 total yards, 4.6 yards per carry, 0.4 touchdowns. So you're looking at two touchdowns every five games. You're looking at over 20 total opportunities between carries and targets and about 20 touches per game with over 100 total yards from scrimmage. You look at him staying healthy. You look at his involvement on the goal line. Those are the two question marks. So Latavius Murray's gone. They do bring in Alexander Madison. I know he has the third round draft capital, but he was really like the 39th pick or 40th pick in the third round for, you know, accounting for compensatory picks. So realistically, 
It's fourth round draft capital. So I, I think had he had the four next to his name, people wouldn't be as excited about Alexander Madison. It wasn't someone I loved as a prospect coming out of school. So I'm not particularly worried about Madison. He is a bigger back though. He's like 5'10", 5'11", 220 pounds. So if there is going to be a back that they want to just you know put right into that uh, goal line role, it would probably be Madison. But since there is no more Latavius, it's possible that Cook gets the first shot at, at winning that three down featured workload, which I kind of like. Um, and he's just so good in the passing game again. The injuries. Whereas a guy like Fournette is more predictive in his injuries because we know that the ankle injuries that he's dealt with have been kind of deteriorating away at, at, at his ligaments and things like that. We have Dr. Jesse Morse on the channel, right, to talk about the injured running backs. He actually pegged Dalvin Cook as his breakout running back candidate of 2019. He has no concerns. He's been on point with the injuries when he's come onto this channel. He has no concerns about Dalvin Cook. I personally probably give my concern level about like five out of 10, which is why I wouldn't put him in that second tier. Uh, but I think like the upside, if, he, if he's gonna give you a 16 full games, Dalvin Cook's gonna be a top five, six fantasy running back. So I like Cook's upside there. Not a guy I'm gonna target in every league, but a guy I definitely wanna own in one or two spots. The other guy in this tier, David Johnson. He's finally moved up my rankings a little bit. I had him moved around a lot. I had a lot of shares of him last year, so I'm semi-biased. He went from like RB10 to RB12. Now he's at my RB8. I still absolutely don't plan on using my first round pick on him. I don't think I'll use my first round pick on either of these guys in this top tier, which is why we have the tiers, right? Because I would use a first rounder on Melvin Gordon and Joe Mixon, but the fall off between those tiers is moving these guys back probably the early second round. What I said on the Fade the Public podcast this week was, or two weeks ago, my bold prediction was that David Johnson was going to end up working his way back into a consensus top five overall fantasy pick. I think by the time drafts come at the end of August, it's going to be those four top backs. And then David Johnson is going to be the number five guy off the board, if not creeping up into that actual tier. Now, he is definitely not going to be in that tier for me. We're already seeing it happen with all the rumors coming out about how, how they're going to run 300 plays a game and how David Johnson is just going to catch 200 passes a game. And he's, you know, he's going to get that 2,000 yards, 1,000 and 1,000. Here's what we haven't seen. David Johnson be a good NFL running back in over two years now. This is going to be going on the third year. The Cardinals were putrid last year. Their offense was horrible. Their offensive line was horrible. Their offensive play calls were horrible. The scheme couldn't have been worse. Literally the last, worst offense of the last five years, probably. But when you take those things aside, when you look at David Johnson just as the player himself, right? Take away all those things. He was horrible, right? And I did some deep, I did some deep dives. He ranked 40th of 47 running backs last year term in terms of PFF's overall running back grade, which does not include offense or offensive line. His elusive rating was 43rd out of 47th, and his missed tackles forced per attempt, 0 0.09. Literally only Jamal Williams was worse last year in that category. His juke rate on player profiler was 51st among running backs. His yards created per carry was 52nd. So in nowhere can you find a objective statistic about David Johnson being a good running back last year. The other thing that pisses me off a lot too is David Johnson was a top 10 fantasy running back last year. So he can't go any worse from there. Here's the thing. He was tied for running back 15 in points per game. So yeah, you could look at the overall finish, but that doesn't win you weeks. When you look at it points per game wise, when he was actually in your lineup, he was tied for running back 15, 13.7 fantasy points per game. That was below Marlon Mack, tied with Chris Carson, Leonard Fournette, Philip Lindsay on a point per game basis. So stop with the top 10 shit without taking it into context, please. When you look at a guy like James Conner, right? He was running back eight last year in fantasy points per game, 19.1 fantasy points per game. So you want to, you know, David Johnson was top 10, top nine in, in fantasy last year. His points per game were almost six points per game less than a guy like James Conner, who was actually the RB8 in fantasy points per game last year. So yes, DJ can absolutely improve, and I expect him to, you know, with the new offense coming in. Cliff Kingsbury is going to run more plays. They're going to throw the ball a lot more. He's going to have more receptions. Let's say he improves by two and a half points per game, almost three points per game. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's an extra 40 fantasy points on the year for an extra three overall touchdowns and 220 total yards. Even if he adds that onto his game, he's still like a full three points per game lower than where James Conner was last year. I don't know. I don't know. Something in me, I know, I understand the hype and I'm probably being biased, but something in me tells me not to draft David Johnson because we haven't seen him be good in a long time, guys. I'm a big fan of Kyler Murray and I think he will spread this offense around, but they still have a very poor offensive line. I know they made additions, but none of their additions are groundbreaking. None of them were, I don't think any of them were even average offensive linemen. I think all of them were below average if you're looking at how they performed last year. So you can miss me with the offensive line additions and all that shit. The volume should probably be there again but like I still don't love there's a lot of red flags internally for me around David Johnson 
So let's move on to tier four. This tier gets a little bit bigger. And this is the second to last tier. So we have tier four, like them, but do we love them? First guy on this tier is Marlon Mack. So we have Marlon Mack, Damian Williams, Le'Veon Bell, Nick Chubb, James Conner, Carrion Johnson. Marlon Mack, I absolutely love. That's well documented this offseason for me. Um, he is going to be one of my top breakout candidates. And I'm pretty sure I'm single-handedly pushing his draft ADP up right now. He's become an early to mid staple of the third. I'm proud of you guys. It's finally getting higher. I do only really draft with people that's in my audience. So that would make sense given I just keep fucking spewing Mac propaganda. I had a funny exchange with Josh ADHD on Twitter the other day. If you're not following him, he's a great follower, great analytical mind in the industry. He posted one of his best ball rosters and I saw Marlon Mack there, you know, in his RB slot at the 3-3. And I sent him a tweet. I sent him a gif, you know, of like me playing with scissors, Mac 303. And that was indicative of, you know, me saying sharp, right? It was a sharp pick at 303. He follows up saying he just has to live. I thought that was like, I couldn't explain Mac, Marlon Mack and his situation, his 2019 fantasy outlook any better. So that is what I'm gonna be saying for Marlon Mack from now on. People try to argue with me about he's a bad third round pick. He's a bad whatever pick. All I'm gonna say is he just has to live. He's in the single best situation for any fantasy running back this season. Maybe you could make the argument for Damian Williams, but coming off of last year, where Marlon Mack was actually operating as a true workhorse for like 10 plus games compared to Williams for like four, I would take Marlon Mack's situation right now. The concern everyone has, of course, is his lack of involvement in the passing game because of Naeem Hines. I get that. It's definitely something I'm acknowledging, but he's not like a Derrick Henry, where Derrick Henry, you can go back to college and he was getting a 4% target share. Marlon Mack was like an 85th percentile college target share kind of guy. And you do look at Naeem Hines, right? 81 targets last year, tied for seventh highest among running backs and probably would easily be top five on a normal year. But it wasn't like it wasn't like that when Mack was on the field. When you look at the splits for Naeem Hines, there were the four games that he missed. And that is when Naeem Hines went actually absolutely off, right? Seven receptions a game, 8.5 targets, 0.5 receiving touchdowns. Look at the games where Mack played. 2.9 receptions, 3.9 targets. And in the 14 games the two played together, that split does not include playoffs. That's only the regular season. They played in the playoffs together. And guess what? Mac out-targeted and out-caught him. Naeem Hines literally was not involved at all in the playoffs. He had zero catches on zero targets. Hines averaged just 1.2 more receptions per game than Mac did in those 14 games which was aided completely by a nine catch game when they played against Jacksonville. And it was like six nothing and they couldn't get anything going. So they were just passing it a thousand times. So I'm not saying Marlon Mack is going to catch 50 to 60 passes, but I think there's this idea that Naeem Hines is an elite pass catching back. And that's just not true when Marlon Mack is on the field. Marlon Mack scored 10 touchdowns in 12 regular season games, guys. He is the undisputed goal line back there. Jordan Wilkins just ain't it, chief. And Naeem Hines is very small. He's not going to be the goal line back. We know that. This was a top five scoring offense last year with a elite offensive line that's young and only going to get better. They are going to have a, so many scoring opportunities. If you gave me an 11 and a half over under total, I want, I want to hear that actually down below. Comment that down below. I want to hear your opinion on this. I'm going to set the over under for total touchdowns this year at 11 and a half. He played 12 games last year with 10. And two of those games, he was either injured or coming back from an injury, and he played like 30% of the snaps. If you're getting Marlon Mack for a full 16, and yes, the injury concerns are there, but they were hamstrings. They're not like the serious injuries that kill your legs. They just need more time to heal. So if he comes into the season fully healthy, Marlon Mack's a good bet to go for 16. And he's a good bet. He's a good bet to go for 16 games and 16 touchdowns, to be honest with you. He's almost like the Devontae Adams of two years ago before he turned elite, right? Like, I don't want to rely on touchdowns because they're super volatile. And I don't want to rely on running backs that don't catch as many passes. That was like Devontae Adams, right? He wasn't a high PPR guy. But both of them are locked in for double-digit touchdowns if they're on the field. And if Mac is, if Mac scored 10 touchdowns in 12 games last year, if he's going to score double-digit touchdowns this year over the span of a full season, he's going to be a top 12 fantasy running back. There's really, there's almost no disputing that. How many times does a double-digit touchdown score not finish inside the top 12 as a fantasy quarterback? That's the argument I think you need to make. Just how good of the situation is and how likely he is to score a ridiculous number of touchdowns. Then we have Damian Williams breaking down this last tier. Now he's a bit of an enigma. There are so many variables and so many moving parts. Yes, I understand this is low because his upside is so high. Every time there's a new risk variable red flag thrown into a player outlook that just makes him a little bit more risky. He is right now the 13th running back off the board, 24th overall. So that's about where I have him. I think I have him. What do I have in RB? I have him as RB 10. So I'm actually way higher on the consensus right now. Let's break down the pros and cons. Pros. 
starting running back for the Chiefs. Scored 34.8 points per game last year, first in the NFL. 418 and a half total yards per game, first in the NFL. Top five pace in terms of second per play. Offense that moves quickly, a lot of plays, a lot of scoring. Legit NFL workhorse size and speed, 5'11", 222. I think this is a, a thing that's probably underrated when it comes to Damian. He legit has workhorse size. And he ran a 4.45 40 yard dash, which puts him in the 95th percentile for weight adjusted speed score. This is elite. This is what you look for when you're looking for a workhorse breakout running back. He signed a two year extension last year, so KC obviously has plans for him and they like him. It was a mid season extension. All of the reports are out of KC saying that he is the starter. Their GM, Brett Veach, came out starting running back job is Williams is to lose. The OC, Eric Bianimi, someone's going to correct me. Damian Williams is our starter. We expect him to excel in that role. They don't have much competition here. Carlos Hyde hasn't been good in like four years. He's old. He's not going to do much besides be a depth play. Darwin Thompson, sixth round pick for as much as I like him. He's a sixth round pick. He's not anywhere near as, as explosive or as athletic as Damian Williams is. And much, much, much smaller. Very small compared to Damian Williams. You got Booby Williams, who's literally undrafted. Um, so we'll see if he even makes the roster. Darrell Williams, who also is a nice size speed guy, but he's clearly far behind Amy Williams. So it's a lot of like random guys that you could just kind of throw in the mix, but none of them have legit air to the throne like Damian Williams does. He has three down ability. He has three down ability, right? Six games where he took over as the guy towards the end of the year last year, including the playoffs. He saw 33 targets, which is five and a half per game. He caught 28 of them, 4.7 receptions per game. He's got the size to be goal line back, short yardage back, in between the tackles back, but he's also very capable of pass blocking given the size and he catches Lots of balls thrown his way. He's a very efficient pass catcher. Um, he also has a 34 catch season on the college resume, which tells you that he's good enough in the pros to catch passes. I usually like to see like a 25 catch season on the college resume for me to be like confident in the guy being a good pass catcher. He also had a 25 carry game in the playoffs versus Indianapolis, went for 129 yards and a touchdown, 5.2 yards per carry. So that tells you on a given day, he can handle a workload like that. Although, you know, in regular season games, he's not really getting more than like 13 carries. He can if he needs to. He showed us that. So that's like the real thing here is is the fact that like they keep coming out and saying that he is the unquestioned starter, right? And when you have that, it's like, sure, it's coach speak to a point, but if they keep saying it over and over and over again, they probably mean it. And it's better than than a coach coming out and saying like, we have a lot of good guys in this backfield. They're all going to play a role and they're all going to do really good things for us. They're like, they're not even making that a possibility. They're just coming out and saying straight up like, he's our guy right? So it's up to you. Like you're subjectively just saying he can't handle that load when the Chiefs are continually coming out and saying by not, you know, signing an actual good free agent, by not drafting anyone inside the top five rounds at the running back position, they're telling you that they love him as their starting running back. Like I, there's not much more I need to see. There's not much more I need to hear really. In terms of the cons, it's like he is 27. So why didn't he break out that early? Why is he taking five years in order to actually carve out somewhat of a role? Adam Gase, probably the reason, being the head coach in Miami for three of those years. The only year he wasn't, it was his rookie year. So how much could you really have expected out of uh, Damian Williams in Miami? The sample size is extremely small on Damian Williams. We're projecting from a four, five, six game sample size, which we hate to do here. So often people take like the end of last season and they just assume it's going to project to next season when you literally have an eight month period of teams switching their game plans, teams switching their rosters, coaches changing, flipping over. So much changes during that time. So, so to just assume that it's going to be the same thing is naive, except for when they're just telling you over and over and over again that it is going to be the same thing. We've never seen him hold up over a year. Doesn't mean he can't, but it is a little bit concerning that we've never seen it. So it's just a risk. The other con I would say is that there's no allegiance to him, right? He's an undrafted free agent. He came over from Miami. So yes, they gave him that two-year extension, but it's not like they gave him two years, 25 million. So the fact that they don't really have an allegiance to him other than money, which really that isn't that much money, you know, they could sit him if he starts playing poorly, non-efficiently, and really not have to think twice about it. The other thing is like in his first four years in Miami, he did not appear in 16 games in any of those seasons. He never saw more than 50 carries in a regular season. He still has not. He's not seen over 50 carries in a regular season. So that's kind of a concern. And those first four years, his yards per carry were all sub 4.0. 3.4, 3.7, 3.3, 3.9. Probably again that he's in Miami. But listen, in the third round, I'm a fan of Williams. Go get your RB1, go get your wide receiver one, get Williams as your running back two. As long as reports keep coming out that he looks really good and he is that guy, he's a great third round pick. I think if you get into the second round, I think you're getting a little bit risky. Again, I acknowledge the upside is ridiculous for a running back in this offense. But there's a lot of red flags here. Let's move on to Le'Veon Bell. I'm not a big fan of him. He's my RB11, but he's currently right now the seventh running back off the board, ninth overall. 
I will not be using my first round pick on him. He should secure a high volume, but is this offense going to be good? Is this offensive line going to be any good? Reports that Adam Gase already surfaced that he didn't want him. Le'Veon Bell is not exactly the most secure person. This shirt would actually fit him very well. Comes out and like starts tweeting about it and shit. There could be locker room issues really, really quickly. Just Adam Gase, how he handles his running backs. Like he was so bad at using his running backs in Miami. Their offense was bottom five over those three years of being a head coach in just about every single measurable statistic. Yards per drive, time of possession per drive, plays per drive, touchdowns per drive, their pace. Like all of it was horrible obviously there's something to be said about volume but like i said like david johnson got the volume last year in that offense it was a bad offense and he was tied for 15 in terms of points per game for running backs do you want your first round pick to do that no because that will absolutely kill you so bell can get 300 plus touches 300 350 plus touches but if you're averaging 4.0 yards per carry and i'm one that doesn't expect him to get eight, i don't think he's going to get 80 targets right i think he's probably going to be closer to that 70 maybe 65 60 range, right? So that's going to absolutely kill his value a little bit there. I know a lot of people are going to like Bell, but he's just personally not in my not in my draft zone at where he's currently going off. Then we have Nick Chubb, James Conner, and Carrion rounding out this tier. None of these three would surprise me if they ended up finishing in the top five, six, seven, whatever. Nick Chubb, we have some concern, his lack of involvement in the passing game, but for the eight games that he took over, if you look at the pace, like he's on pace to catch 35, 40 passes, which is fine in a normal year. Again, Remember that it was a crazy year in terms of running back pass catching. When it comes to Nick Chubb, I like him a lot more in Dynasty than I do in season long. I'm not nervous about taking him in Dynasty whatsoever because all of his concerns stem around one, lack of involvement in the passing game, but he'll be fine passing, like catching passes one because Duke Johnson will be out of here after next this year, the end of this year, the earliest. The other thing is like Kareem Hunt. Kareem Hunt is going to come back in week eight, week nine, and that might hurt his redraft. That might hurt his only 2019 fantasy outlook. As long as Kareem Hunt stays on the field, stays healthy and plays like even close to as productive as he was in Kansas City, someone is going to give him a nice contract. Someone's going to give him 40 years, $30 million. He is so young, coming off of a rushing title during his rookie year. I said this in one of the episodes last week. He's going to get a Jarek McKinnon type contract. If Jarek McKinnon got four years, $32 million, why wouldn't Kareem Hunt, who's younger, a better runner, more proven already than Jarek McKinnon? So it's not going to be the Browns. They have a lot of money locked up in OBJ, a lot of money locked up in Jarvis Landry. They're going to have to pay Baker Million like $500 million. So I highly doubt that their concern is their backup running backs contract. So he's probably gone after this year too. So Nick Chubb, Dynasty, absolutely love him as someone who's going underrated, dropping to the third round in some drafts. But for this year, yeah, he would have normally, had they not signed Kareem Hunt, he probably would have been a first round pick for me. I probably would have picked him in the back half of the first round. That being said, Kareem Hunt could absolutely come back and take over the pass catching role there, right? And Kareem Hunt, uh, Nick Chubb might catch a pass or two a game, maybe over the second half of the year. Which will really, um, which will really hurt him. But it's going to be a good offense. I think his floor is really safe in terms of carries. It does make me a little bit nervous with Kareem Hunt there. James Conner is the other one. You know, he's he's making me really nervous towards the back half of the first, early second round. I think his range of outcomes is all over the place, and I think maybe a lot of people will disagree with me here. But I think his ceiling is probably what we saw last year, which was which was very good. So he does deserve to be in this tier. But last year, Conner saw ninety percent of the snaps and touches out of the Pittsburgh backfield. Do we think that's going to happen? Jalen Samuels filled in very 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 nicely for James Conner when he missed that three game stretch at the end of the year which is back-to-back years in which Conner has missed multiple games as well so if you're worried about Melvin Gordon as an injury concern I think James Conner needs to be looked at in that same light when Conner finally returned to week 17 against the Bengals he returned to week 17 against the Bengals Samuels out targeted him eight to three caught seven passes compared to Conner's three is that what we're going to see in this backfield in 2018 or 2019 because if that's the case Connor's very high receiving workload is not going to still be there and that's going to hurt his fantasy value and I've mentioned this quite a few times throughout the offseason the Steelers hired the former NC State tight ends and fullbacks coach Eddie Faulkner as their new running backs coach that is where Jalen Samuels played his college ball under this same coach that worked personally with him he caught 202 balls at NC State if there's anyone on earth that is going to know how to use uh, Jalen Samuels and going to push him to play and get on the field it's this guy Faulkner I think we're going to see a lot bigger of a split I think maybe James Conner's numbers come down from 90% snap share to like 65 70 and Jalen Samuels take some of those. I also think like from a raw talent perspective, James Conner is not on the level of these other guys, right? If we're being objective about it, he does have some highlight plays for sure, but he's not that good in terms of elusiveness and creative creating yards as these other top tier guys. And I think that usually plays itself out over the long run. And we already saw it work really well for one year, but very rarely do you see, you know, a guy that's like average in talent 
play really well for one, two, three, you know, an elongated period of time. His yards created per carry, 38th among running backs. His PFF rushing grade, 26th. 26th in yak, 20th in tackles evaded per attempt. So not highly ranked, not highly regarded in that. So in theory, it's a good situation. It's a passing, it, it, it's Pittsburgh's offense, which always uses a workhorse, but they've really always had Le'Veon Bell. And when they didn't have Le'Veon Bell, it was D'Angelo Williams who they chose to ro- ride. Like who else did they have behind him? Le- fucking T- Toussaint, whatever his name was. They should be a bit more run heavy this year, which I'll touch more so in Wednesday's video with the wide receiver rankings broken down by tier. My gut just tells me that Connor's going to fit finish more as a mid to low RB2 than like where you'll probably have to draft him in the beginning of the second round, where I would much rather take a Juju Smith-Schuster there or an elite, another elite wide receiver over James Conner. I, I see his receiving level come down a bit. And I see him having a lot of games where like Alex Collins or Jay Ajayi, where he gets 16, you know, 16, 18 carries, 65 yards, but only catches one or two passes. And those are going to leave you with a lot of dud games. So the last guy in this tier, Carrion Johnson. There's a good chance I end up moving him ahead of Carrion. I mean, James Conner, which I know is definitely a bull taken in the minority. I absolutely love Carrion more than I love life itself at this point. What is Carrion's floor? That's, that's the thing. I think where I have him ranked is probably his floor. Points per game last year, he was a top 16 fantasy running back. That's including including the games at the beginning of the year where he was in a ridiculous split with LeGarrette Blunt and was ridiculously underutilized. People are underestimating just how much he was involved in the passing game though once he really took over that role as as the leader in that backfield. And we're worried about a, a running back by committee. Like why? It's fucking CJ Anderson, y'all. He's like 38. Yeah, he looked good in the Rams backfield, but that that, that just ain't it, man. After weeks 1 and 2, where Carrion played on 35% of the snaps. Carrion had 14 touches or more in every game except one of the next eight games. So I think we're getting a minimum of 15 touch floor out of Carrion Johnson. And I don't, I, like, who, are you going to dispute that? Would, if I told you that Carrion's going to get, even the people who don't like Carrion at all, 15 touches a game, realistic, right? 15, 16, 17, you're starting to get up into that 260, 280 touch range. That's good enough. If you're giving Carrion Johnson 275, 280 touches, I think he's going to be a top 12, top 10 fantasy running back. So I absolutely love Carrion Johnson there. All right, big homies. You've made it this far with me. Let's close it out. We got one last tier. This is a tier we call Jesus Take the Wheel. I'm hurt, dog. Don't ask me if I'm all right. Hell no. What he said dominate, and we not doing it. I put my heart in this dog. Let's go, man. Let's go. Let's go. I gotta turn my AC unit off. I'm starting to get the donut sweats, TBH. TBH. I'm working around this like I'm a fucking pigeon. You know what it is? Like they're sticky too. Cause they like home make them so they use all this butter and whatever. So I, st- I do it and then I can't touch my laptop. So it's a problem. Slowly but surely we're gonna dominate these donuts. I'm going to help y'all dominate your 2019 fantasy football season. Tier number five. At number 15, Sony Michelle, Aaron Jones, David Montgomery, Todd Gurley, Derrick Henry, Leonard Fournette. Yes, you heard that correctly. I am taking David Montgomery in redraft over Todd Gurley this year. Mainly because I'm just not taking Todd Gurley, but let's break it down. This is probably the tier that's going to make or break a lot of fantasy seasons. If you take Derrick Henry, he could be a top five running back. But 99.999% of the possibility is that he's not going to do that. Leonard Fournette. What if he stays healthy for 16 games, gives you 400 touches? No fucking way is his little ankle going to hold up for 400 touches. Y'all are ridiculous. Anyways, we have Sony Michelle, Derrick Henry, right? Two guys that don't catch passes, so it's easy. they're the easiest to tell who's going to be volatile and who's going to be game script dependent. End of season number is going to be there, maybe, but they'll give you plenty of weekly games that are 13 for 52, 14 for 60, and then one catch for eight yards. Like I mentioned earlier, right, last year was a historic year for pass catching running back. You have Deion Lewis who caught 59 passes, which would typically rank within the top five among running backs, if not higher amongst the position. He's still going to be heavily involved in this Tennessee Titans backfield. Sony has, you know, there's a lot of weird conflicting reports right now that Sony hasn't been on the field taking snaps. It's the fucking Damian Harris season. One, there has not been one single confirmed injury on Sony Michelle. We don't have a doctor coming out. We don't have the team coming out and say that something's wrong with his knee. We're all just saying things and assuming things. Damian Harris also has not been on the field. So that needs to quiet down. But Sony Michelle's knee concerns are there prior to this fake news that's coming out, which might come out by the time you see this on Monday and I would look like a real asshole. But well documented throughout his time at Georgia. Last year, plagued him basically all year. Sony Michelle has a knee injury, does not catch passes. They draft Damian Harris in the third round. Even if you don't think he's that good of a talent, they're still going to use him. James White's back. Rex Burkhead's back as well as long as he's not cut. A lot of risk there. Is still a running back in the Patriots backfield that you want to own if you're just looking at one back and you could take him straight up. He has the 12 to 14 touchdown upside. They love using their running backs on the goal line. We've seen it 
many, many times. So probably staying away from him in PPR, any kind of any kind of PPR league, because like he's just very one dimensional in that offense. Same thing with Derrick Henry. So Aaron Jones, everyone loves his talent, guys. Like you're uh, you're not making a hot take when you're like, I love Aaron Jones. Like fuck yeah, obviously everyone loves Aaron Jones. He's fun to watch. He's really efficient. He's really exciting. But there's no part of me that believes that Green Bay is ever going to use him as a workhorse, use him as their featured back. It's almost always going to be a running back by committee there, whether it's Jamal Williams as the thick back or Dexter. Williams. One of the Williams bros, one of the thick Williams brothers is going to be the second piece of that running back by committee. Matt LaFleur literally came out and said that the best approach, the most effective approach to this backfield, this is a quote from him, was a committee approach, a combination of Aaron Jones and one of these other backs. And you can miss me with these reports about Aaron Jones losing 7% body fat and gaining 14 pounds of muscle in a two month period. Like, yo, Stop being ignorant and naive to these reports, guys. It's not even, a lot of people, and this is sad to say, like if you think I go in depth with fantasy, I've, I, I really am interested in nutrition and fitness and health and things like that. And I've done tons of research on that stuff. A lot of people in sports and the fantasy community especially, because they're even like, you know what's funny? A lot of people in sports are ignorant when it comes to this stuff, but fantasy is not even like a sport. It's, it's people behind a computer. So it's like, Technically, you're in sports, but you know even less about actual athletics. Not everyone, of course. There are, I'm sure, a small percentage of people that know way more than I do. But I know a, a, a good enough amount to know when these ridiculous reports come out that they're not, you know, they're very fabricated and very exaggerated. Jones was 208 pounds, right? Reportedly at 11% body fat. If he dropped down to his reported 5.3% body fat, you understand that he's going to weigh in at the season under 200 pounds. You're going to draft. That's literally a fucking mathematical equation right there. That is a stat. That's not an opinion. If you actually take what they said in the report and believe it to be true, he's coming in the season sub 200 pounds. I know he gained 15 pounds of muscle. You can't fucking lose fat and gain muscle at the same time, people. There's two ways you could do that. If you're at the very, very beginning of your fitness journey, like you don't work out at all, and then you start hitting the gym four times a week, five times a week, you can lose fat and gain muscle at the time. At the same time. That's not going to last very long. If you are an NFL caliber athlete who has been working out your body for years and years and years, you can't do that. And if you do, it's over a very elongated period of time. You give your body more calories to gain weight, it could put it towards muscle. If you don't give your body enough calories, it will start eating away at what you have in your body and you can lose fat, but it can't eat away at your body and give you muscle. Like that's just not how science works, people. So you have to understand that first of all. And if you are a very high level athlete and you are doing that process, right? Or you're trying to, it's going to be a very slow process. It's not going to be in three months. It's not going to be in three months since the season ended over a long period of time. I don't mean long. I mean one year, two years, even longer than that. This kind of drastic report is just not true. Just not true. If you believe it, then Jones is coming in as a 200, a sub 200 pound back. And he's, and th- th- you don't want to use a third round pick, fourth round pick on a sub 200 pound back. Here's the thing. Great player. Don't like the situation. He's more of probably like late fourth round at the earliest. Don't start taking Aaron Jones. Don't start getting cute and taking him any earlier than that. I'm starting to really buy into David Montgomery. I'm sorry for that fucking whole spiel I just went nuts about. I really like the fit in this offense from a three down standpoint. You know, I talked about how David Montgomery is not a guy with a lot of bursts, so he needs to go to an offense that runs out of the shotgun because that works way better for guys that are agile under center, right? You're taking two or three steps, so you're bursting through the line. That's great for guys who have a lot of bursts. Montgomery doesn't have that, right? He tested out as a very like average, below average athlete in terms of burst. From shotgun, he could utilize his best attributes, which is agility and making a guy miss in the backfield. Chicago runs like 70 to 75% of their plays in Matt Nagy's system from under shotgun. So I love the standpoint there. Cohen, yes. If you're nervous about Cohen, that's reasonable. He's going to take a lot of snaps there, sure. He played on 46% of the Bears offensive snaps last year. Tariq Cohen did. Of that 46%, though, 35% of those snaps came from the outside or in the slot. So he wasn't even in the backfield. So for 35% of the 46% of snaps he played, he wasn't even in the backfield. So you're realistically looking at someone who plays around 28 to 30% of snaps in the backfield, which means there's 70 plus percent of the time another running back is gonna be on the field. If you give a running back in this offense that can catch the ball, which David Montgomery can do, 70 plus percent of the snaps, he's gonna do pretty well. Jordan Howard was a top 20 fantasy running back last year and he didn't catch passes. David Montgomery is Jordan Howard, but is able to catch passes. Joe Mixon played on 70% of the snaps last year. Melvin Gordon, 72% of the snaps last year. Kamara plays 66% of the snaps. Most backs nowadays play like 60 to 65% of the snaps. That workload is absolutely attainable for a guy like David Montgomery. I have Miles Sanders 
ranked above David Montgomery and Dynasty. I think the long-term outlook is better, but I don't think Miles Sanders were out, will outright take that backfield until, you know, like halfway through the season. So I like Montgomery to come in right away and take that backfield with only Mike Davis there to compete with. Like I said, Jordan Howard caught 20 passes last year and was a top 20 fantasy back. I think Montgomery easily hits that number, probably doubles that number, if not more. And I think he's a pretty safe back, contrary to popular belief, in that fourth round, at least relative. I'm not necessarily taking him there in the fourth round because the wide receivers you can get there are so safe. Brandon Cooks, Stefan Diggs, these are all fourth round guys. Robert Woods even, Kenny Galladay, much rather have one of those guys on my fantasy team than taking one of these risky running backs, but I like him more than the other guys here, and that's why he's my 16th. So you have Fournette and Gurley, who obviously their injury risks are massive. I'm not really going to get into that. If you want to know where I have Josh Jacobs, you know, where's Josh Jacobs, bro? What are you doing with Josh Jacobs? Your first round pick. He's the best fucking running back ever. The guy is a three-year backup at Alabama. Yes, there are other good players there, but we've seen time and again, Derrick Henry, Eddie Lacy, TJ Yeldon, Kenyon Drake, all had their times as the workhorses there. If they're good enough, if you're good enough, you are going to become the workhorse at Alabama. He was there for three years, never surpassed Damian Harris in carries. He was never the starter there. I understand Kenyon Drake never was either, but look at Kenyon Drake now. Kenyon Drake is not a workhorse in the NFL. He's exactly what he was in college. Josh Jacobs is a very below average athlete from a measurable standpoint. Not explosive. He's not fast. He has never produced more than 900 yards. Okay, anyways, I'm getting into this. I'm not even breaking him down in this video, but if you want to know where I have Josh Jacobs ranked, it might be the top 25, might not be, drop a comment down below where you think he should be ranked and you can get my top 25 running back rankings broken down by tier, downloadable. And make sure, again, guys, I remind you, teamstake.com. Make life easy on yourself, on your commissioner this offseason rather than having him or her run around and collect all the money. Teamstake.com, thank you for sponsoring today's video. I love y'all. I love everyone that stuck around this long. I feel like I've been recording for almost two weeks right now. I'm about to dive, I was going to say an explicit word, something first into these donuts we're gonna go with mouth first because we're we're a child friendly channel i love you guys thumbs up subscribe to the channel if you're new i'll see you on wednesday for the same video but wide receivers baby. Let's go.